Welcome everyone to another YIVO Fellowship Lecture. Uh, today's Max Weinreich Fellowship Lecture in Eastern European Jewish Studies was funded by the Professor Bernard Chosey Memorial Fellowship and the Natalie and Mendel Rakolin Memorial Fellowship. And this was in fact for the years 2020, 2021, uh, because of COVID, our lecturer today was not able to come because of the pandemic and is only now been able to give her lecture. Uh, Hannah Abukunova holds her PhD in Holocaust history from the University of Sheffield in the United Kingdom. Currently, she is a researcher and lecturer at the Hugo Valentin Center in Uppsala, Sweden, and is, as mentioned, the former postdoctoral research uh, at uh, Harvard Ukrainian Research Institute and Yad Vashem. Dr. Abukunova, as mentioned, was the Bernard uh, Chosey Memorial Fellow and Natalie and Mendel Rakolin uh, Memorial Postdoctoral Fellow in Eastern European Jewish Studies at the YIVO Institute for Jewish Research in the years 2020-2021. Her research interests encompass history and memory of persecution of Jews and Roma during the Holocaust in Ukraine in a comparative perspective and considers matters such as rescue and self-rescue of Jews and Roma, motivation for the rescue of Jews by non-Jews, deportations of Jews and Roma to Transnistria, and intra-ethnic relations before, during, and after the Holocaust in Ukraine, especially Ukrainian Jewish Roma relations. Dr. Abukunova is the author and co-author of academic works published in several languages in the field of Holocaust studies, Romani studies, Ukrainian studies, and in memory studies. Uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Hanna Abukunova. Um, and I would just like to add that if you do have questions, uh, please, we will have some time at the end uh, to ask them. Please leave them in the Q&A section and not in the chat. Uh, thanks very much. And please welcome uh, Dr. Hanna Abukunova. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? I hope. Yes, thank you so much, Edi, for such a nice introduction. And um, again, welcome everybody. I uh, try, I will try to uh, deliver today's lecture in a more quasi-academic manner. Uh, that it would be interesting for non-specialists uh, who really don't know much about Ukraine, and also for specialists who uh, research uh, Ukraine and the Holocaust. And first of all, I would like to thank uh, to all uh, YIVO staff who made possible my fellowship and helped me enormously in very difficult COVID times uh, when actually I didn't know if I can arrive in person to, to work with archival documents or I have to do it online and we started online then uh, there was a possibility to arrive just uh, two days per week and uh, I'm very grateful that all staff helped me and particularly Eddie Portnoy who all the time led me through all complications, resolved all complications, led through um, all information also, Sarah Belasco, who um, uh, actually is uh, head of a librarian uh, section and as a librarian and other librarians, of course, help, they help me a lot to collect documents. And also, uh, I'm thankful for their patience because I always was late to give documents back. And then I'm enormously grateful to Halel Yadin, who sent me a lot of documents and also uh, showed how to work with them uh, during my YIVO stay. And of course, another uh, archivist, Vital Zaika, who prepared a lot of photographs, maps, and, in, and I could access all of them in a very short time. Uh, and of course, those whom I didn't mention and who worked behind, uh, behind the scene or whom I didn't meet, but those who still made my research possible and also today's lecture possible. Um, so I will share now the screen. Okay, hope you can see it. Do you see the screen, right, Eddie? Yeah. Uh, 
So, uh, my today's lecture uh, is entitled Ukrainian Jewish Relations on the Eve and During the Holocaust. And in fact, I will not talk only uh, about the very Eve, but also about inter uh, inter relations in interwar uh, period. And uh, it's a very interesting uh, story that when I started to research motivation for rescuing and also denunciation of uh, the Jews by Ukrainians in Ukraine, in so an occupied Soviet Ukraine, I didn't think that I will come to uh, research of interethnic relations in interwar period, and particularly call host system. But uh, now I will show you how it is connected. So the first part of my lecture will be about the Kolkhoz system and uh, actual relations between Ukrainians and Jews in 1920s and 1930s. And then I will come to the second part, actual the Holocaust uh, uh, time, and I will discuss reasons uh, for denunciation of the Jews and also for rescuing Jews by non-Jews which the and the reason as i said connected to the interwar and even previous time a uh, russian imperial time i would start uh, with a person named joseph rosen and uh, i will start with the point that uh, almost 80 percent of the time i work uh, of my evo fellowship i worked on archives um, of uh, Joseph Rosen and collection of documents of AgroJoint. Uh, Joseph Rosen was born in Moscow and uh, he studied uh, at Moscow University. Uh, then um, he was a member of uh, uh, Russian Social Democratic Labour Party uh, within the Menshevik fraction. Uh, However, at a certain period of time, he immigrated to the US, particularly in 1903, so in a uh, quite young age. Uh, in the US, he worked in agriculture for two years and then continued his education at Michigan Agricultural College, where he received his degree, MA degree. And after that, he received another degree, PhD, uh, from the University uh, of Minnesota. And his idea was to develop agriculture in a uh, former pale of settlement in order to help the Jews to survive uh, in uh, hunger years and generally to survive and uh, come over the um, poverty because the life for uh, most of the Jews um, in the Soviet Union was not so nice. They lived in poverty, they lived in villages, so in shtetls, uh, special um, towns where about 40, 50 percent, sometimes 80 percent population consisted of the Jews. And what, uh, what Jews did in um, those uh, towns and villages, uh, they had some uh, trading, they uh, uh, worked um, as um, some specialists like shoemaking, uh, tailor, uh, there were tailors, and um, some of them uh, were a little bit richer and worked on jewelries. Um, again, exchange, selling, production, making, uh, but majority actually uh, lived in, as I said, in poverty. Uh, so, experiencing uh, such life and uh, also knowing about uh, the pogroms which uh, occurred uh, mainly in 1918-1921 during the civil war um, uh, in former Russian Empire. After in 1918, the Russian Empire collapsed. Um, Rosen uh, decided to join, uh, actually the joint um, uh, uh, and American Relief Administration. Administration which helped uh, the Jews uh, to survive uh, pogroms and then also um, the consequences of pogroms, I mean, and also uh, hunger uh, years, 1921 
to um, up to 23, uh, when the first hunger occurred in former Russian imperial lands. Um, his participation in joint led to um, creation of a new subsection of joint, uh, which is agro joint, particularly a distribution committee, which was devoted to creation of agricultural uh, Jewish settlements uh, in the former pile of settlements. And uh, Rosen started to investigate how it's possible to do. And the investigation um, was led in two directions. First, uh, Rosen tried to explain um, American uh, society and um, uh, uh, collect and dollars for such settlements because first of all uh, the money had to be collected to this uh, to be distributed to for creation of such settlements other direction was uh, negotiation with the soviet government uh, for creation of such settlements and actually there was also third direction because both first were impossible without understanding the situation uh, uh, in which Jews uh, found themselves after the collapse of their uh, Soviet uh, uh, of their sorry of the Russian Empire and establishment of the Soviet Union in 19 in um, 1922 and then 24 joint other republics so what happened uh, Rosen uh found several uh people who would be interested in going to uh particularly uh, ukrainian lands and observe how people live there uh those people uh were from the united states and also some local uh, from ukraine and uh, there were several reports produced by those people uh reports uh, very regular on ordinary life of Ukrainians and the Jews. Uh, those reports covered such topics like um, economic situation, uh, family relationships, uh, relations between Ukrainians and the Jews in certain uh, particular uh, localities with examples uh, particular examples. Also, um, those reports um, revealed some consequences of the pogroms, like uh, kill, how many uh, Jews were killed during pogroms or left certain locations, uh, how many houses or which locations were completely robbed or destroyed by pogromers and uh, actually uh, which help Jews would need. Uh, all those reports uh, were presented uh, during uh, one of the joint committees and there was a decision that really American joint has to negotiate with the Soviet government to create such settlements because first it will help the Jews to survive uh, and economic situation. Uh, and second, uh, it will secure them from non-Jews. And it means secure them to a certain extent uh, from possible other pogroms. Uh, the joint started to negotiate with uh, the uh, Soviet government and the negotiation was not easy. The Soviet government all the time tried to uh, request more and more. In the beginning, uh, there was an unequal uh, request uh, between the USA uh, uh, joint, I mean, uh, and the USA in Dower and uh, also uh, between uh, the representatives of the Soviet power that actually the Soviets also will distribute some money and will help. Eventually, every other meeting, the Soviets uh, claimed uh, more and more from uh, the USA. And uh, there was a final negotiation 
the, then the Soviet Union will provide the lands. And that's all. And all other uh, tasks, uh, bringing money, uh, bringing equipment, uh, helping with education, how to deal with the lands and agriculture, uh, establishment of um, establishment of substructure, infrastructure, like uh, building hospitals, schools, and uh, other institutions which would help uh, the Jews uh, to learn how to uh, work on the land. Uh, all these uh, were demanded from the joint, and joint agreed. Uh, also, joint was responsible for relocation the Jews, responsible physically to organize it, and responsible financially to uh, provide help for, and uh, provide transportation. So, joint agreed to do all these. All this information is dispersed in files uh, of huge Rosen archive, which consists of um, more than uh, 300 reels and folders, and each folder four, 500 pages. Um, however, uh, systematic analysis of those files uh, allows to uh, make uh, this uh, general picture, which I try to um, overview. So, um, in 1924, Joint uh, started to organize uh, agricultural Jewish settlements. And uh, already in 1925, there were first results. Do you see the map? And this is contemporary map with some of uh, major uh, Jewish uh, kolkhozes settlements which were created, and particularly Mark II in uh, Dnipro, former Dnipropetrovsk region, and in Kherson region. But actually, uh, at that time, it was Odessa region. Uh, those two uh, settlements were called Kalinindorf and Stalindorf. And they were major with uh, uh, all uh, built infrastructure as well, like I said, hospitals, schools. Uh, so it was like a completely separated unit. What happened further is that um, Rosen uh, tried to collect reports uh, from the neighborhood. Uh, how is the situation going on? Uh, and also from inside of kolkhozes. Such kolkhoz, um, they eventually started to be called kolkhoz, like the Soviet collective farms. Um, so such Jewish kolkhozes were quite successful. Even in the first two, three years, there were some problems with transferring uh, money, with transferring equipment or producing equipment on the place, but mostly was transferred. And um, uh, also some negotiation with the local authorities. But after overcoming those problems, uh, Jewish kolkhozes became quite successful. However, the reports uh, revealed the information that neighbors, uh, mainly Ukrainians, because uh, kolkhozes were established mainly in Ukrainian lands south, as you see, south, east, and also later Crimea. So Ukrainians uh, complained that actually Jews started to live better, uh, that uh, they receive help from abroad and nobody helps Ukrainians. And this is unfair, uh, as well as strange, because uh, those Jews live in their own environment and they speak own language, whereas they are still living in Ukrainian land. There was not one report, but several uh, with expressions of such sort. Uh, however, Joint continued to sponsor uh, kolkhozes. And particular attention uh, was paid to, as I said, Dnipro, Dnipropetrovsk and uh, Odessa Oblast. This is uh, the ex excerpt from the document where it says that uh, joint uh, in 1933 uh, relocated five and a half thousand families to kolkhozes and um, Actually, uh, particular attention was paid to those two kolkhozes as most successful. 
So another uh, uh, historical event, uh, infamous event happened in 1932-33. Uh, Stalin government organized uh, man-made uh, famine. Uh, which is uh, known in Ukrainian history as Holodomor. And it was um, directed against Ukrainian peasants, um, first of all, to uh, control uh, the grain uh, and to control um, by this uh, all relations between states, so the Soviet state and peasants, Ukrainian peasants. Uh, I will not go to the history of Holodomor, but I just will say that uh, there is a vast uh, literature and uh, all this literature uh, confirms that uh, Holodomor was uh, organized purposely and uh, you can find uh, some of of uh, research in internet, or if you would be interested, I can uh, also provide you later via email. So what happened in 32, 33? Um, huge starvation and uh, some cases of cannibalism, some uh, cases when, uh, and I know this from my own field work and interview uh, uh, cases when people ate dogs, when people actually collected dry leaves and mixed them with earth and then uh, stored for the winter to survive. At the same time, uh, 32, 33, also depression, Great Depression in the USA and financial situation is not good. So uh, some less finances went to Jewish colleges. However, uh, Jewish colleges still, uh, according to reports of joint, still were successful. And it was said that we can state that despite not significant size of agricultural lands, organized agricultural production in, in Stalindorf district and Kalinindorf district gave a significant aid with provisions and in some colleges even brought some monetary benefits. And when we see this and compare the situation, what's going on in Ukraine, uh, we see two completely different worlds. One world that some successful colleges, not all of them were successful, and also death uh, uh, from hunger happened in colleges, but some of them were successful. At the same time, Ukrainian villages, uh, uh, all peasantry basically died out of starvation. And some reports, after uh, 33, the reports of 34, 35 uh, contain some information about uh, the Holodomor and that Ukrainians actually uh, started to have even more anti Semitic uh, feelings because uh, in some villages they saw that Jews survived uh, the Holodomor better. Again, I don't say that all the Jews and all colleges were successful, no, but some of them were. And what it means, it means that uh, there was a huge wave of new anti-Semitic uh, um, feelings and attitudes to the Jews. And generally, I will go back a little bit later and explain anti-Semitism and uh, all this line, how uh, it goes from Russian, the Russian Empire through the Soviet Union and uh, to the Holocaust period. But this is very important to emphasize that uh, the Holodomor uh, was uh, definitely Holodomor for Ukrainians, but it was not so great famine for the Jews. On the other hand, there were some instances which I can observe through uh, interviews, and this is another uh, huge uh, collection from YIVO, interviews, testimonies of Jewish uh, Holocaust survivors who also uh, described their life be before the Holocaust. And in such testimonies, uh, rarely but can be seen the pattern that some Jews helped Ukrainians to survive Holodomor. 
particularly the Jews who were in colchoses. They brought some uh, food to neighboring Ukrainian families with whom they were acquainted. And like this, Jews helped Ukrainians to survive. Uh, so another uh, successful uh, matter uh, also happened in 1933, that Agro Joint also spent only old actives and not uh, collected new uh, uh, finances. That was a very positive uh, scene in their uh, joint and also uh, for philanthropists uh, who couldn't anymore uh, provide more money because of the Great Depression in the USA. And also, they had to survive. So, okay. And I don't know. Oh. Now, I uh, want to give you a little bit uh, geographical overview. So we talk basically about Soviet Ukraine, which is marked as green. Uh, you see this green borders. This is the Soviet Ukraine before 1939. And to understand the reasons uh, uh, for um, certain attitudes of Ukrainians towards the Jews, we have to understand also how people lived. Uh, what were the Jewish groups? Uh, what were um, actually appearances of both groups and communications between each other? Uh, what was the identity of Ukrainians? And what was the identity of the Jews? According to uh, Tzvi Gittelman, um, we can divide uh, all Jews, let's say, into uh, relatively four groups. Religious Jews, secular Yiddishists, who considered themselves secular but spoke Yiddish. Secular Hebraists, uh, those who spoke Hebrew but were non-religious. And absolutely secular Jews who considered themselves Russian or Ukrainians, actually, and spoke Russian or Ukrainian or mixed. But uh, after uh, 27, 28, actually, Russification uh, was spread in the Soviet Ukraine, and most of people had to speak uh, ma uh, and must uh, uh, learn uh, new uh, Russian language. So um, before 27, 28, there was a policy of colonization uh, when Ukrainians could speak and learn own language. But after that time, everything was Russified. So I would say that it's not so simple to divide um, Jews into such groups. It's more complex because there were also intergrouping. But um, to understand is very important because actually we go a little bit back to anti-Semitism and pre-war anti-Semitism to, to understand a relationship then. And uh, we know about the pogroms in Kishinev and uh, Odessa, uh, terrible pogroms which were mostly uh, targeted um, uh, against uh, religious Jews or uh, Jews who observed some traditions. Uh, also, we have uh, in 1918, 1913, there was Bailey's case. The case uh, when uh, Menachem Bailey's, Ukrainian Jew, religious Jew, was accused in killing innocent Ukrainian boy. Eventually, uh, the killers were found, but investigation and trial uh, uh, took place for two years, and uh, despite the fact that uh, Bailey's was freed and um, killers uh, of this boy were found and imprisoned, still, and this anti-Semitic uh, attitude to Jews uh, spread more just because of information of of such possibility. And accusation why Bailey killed the innocent Ukrainian boy was obvious for, uh, as usual, it's blood feud to use the blood of uh, innocent uh, non-Jewish children uh, for uh, preparing matzah, uh, Jewish traditional, um, uh, some sort, I would say, of bread for, for Passover. And this blood feud, uh, 
we can see in history in all countries in different periods. It was not something new for Ukraine. However, interwar anti-Semitism, 1821, more than one and a half thousand pogroms. And actually, recently, Jeffrey Weidlinger uh, published a book about pogroms with very precise uh, look into some of them. So what happened during those pogroms? Uh, more than 200,000 Jews were wounded, according to some research, and unknown number of women raped, Jewish women. And also, according, again, to different research, between 100 and 200,000 Jews were killed. It's a huge number, and uh, we don't talk here about looted property, destroyed houses, completely destroyed. The people couldn't, the Jewish people couldn't leave. And um, uh, actually, uh, um, I would like to give you one citation from um, a witness from the town of Pishana, Odessa Governorate, in late 19, early 20. There are about 70 tombs of Jews in our cemetery who were brutally murdered by bandits. This is without counting those who, uh, who uh, disappeared and was not found until now. There are villages in neighborhood where the Jews lived since olden times. Many of those Jews were killed and others resett resettled in the town, but they are in danger of death. Here as well, because the entire gang is consisted of local and neighboring peasants. These peasants are in hiding by others, and it is too difficult to catch them. Uh, the pogroms uh, continued, and uh, one of the very main uh, pogroms occurred in Proskuriv, uh, which is called Proskuriv Pogrom, but actually uh, now it is uh, town uh, city of Khmelnytsky. Um, on the other hand, uh, despite of pogroms, um, some researchers uh, like uh, Weindlinger and also Huda Bauer confirmed that in shtetls, relations between Jews and uh, Ukrainians actually were not so bad and neighbors help each other. They uh, went uh, for holidays to each other. Uh, they uh, maintained quite friendly relationship. So how this happened? And here, um, we see a double relationship. On the one hand, traditional anti-Semitism. On the other hand, quite nice relationship. Um, when uh, the Germans uh, arrived, they needed to also identify the Jews. And here we go actually again to 20s and 30s. And we have to understand what was the identity of the Jews, how they could um, appear different to Ukrainians and also to the German Nazis. And uh, we have to uh, actually uh, research identity and nationality in the Soviet Union, where in documents, in certificate of birth uh, of every person, the nationality was stated. So it was written that one is Ukrainian, one is Russian, one is Jew, one is uh, Tatar, and so on. And by find, find, uh, finding such documents, also occupiers uh, could identify the Jews. Um, uh, other registry as well uh, could tell this. Uh, for example, church uh, registry of only baptized people and non-baptized were under the question, or registry of certain uh, living in certain neighborhood. Religion and traditional way of life as well played a huge role because religious Jews uh, are visible in terms of their outfit, in terms of uh, observing certain traditions. Of course, language. In many places, Jew, uh, Jews uh, spoke only Yiddish. And even in big cities, uh, there was separate, according to the testimonies, there were separate quarters where Jews uh, spoke Yiddish or sometimes could speak broken Ukrainian or Russian. And as I already uh, said about shtetls, districts, kolkhozes, separate settlements where Jews just could be identified very easily. Uh, in some uh, cases, physical appearance was different than from Slavic people. And of course, uh, identification by non-Jewish neighbors that leads us to the anti-Semitic tradition and also leads us to 
uh, all and friendly relations to Jewish colhoses, which uh, was uh, raised during 1930s. So here you can see how religious Jews uh, were seen in Eastern Galicia, quite, uh, quite a distinctive outfit from Ukrainians and uh, non-religious Jews. This is exactly on the eve of the Holocaust. So th then we have to go a little bit to history. And in 1939, what happened? Incorporation of certain territories by the Soviets. Uh, this incorporation followed uh, by their German-Soviet secret protocols. Uh, and also Molotov, uh, which is called Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. So what happened? Southern Bessarabia, you see a green um, area, it's Bessarabia, and upper part is currently in Moldova, and lower part is currently Ukraine. This southern Bessarabia was taken by the Soviets. Northern Bukovina, you see orange, again, upper and lower part, and upper part is a Ukrainian part, was taken... Um, uh, also by the Soviets. Both parts were taken from Romania, according to, Ger to the German-Soviet uh, agreement, secret agreement. Then another part was taken from uh, Pol Polish lands, Volinia. Uh, you can see a uh, yellow, uh, yellowish part. And then Eastern Galicia, green. And Eastern, it's to the right, because uh, Galicia is divided to Western and Eastern. So you can see particularly the map with uh, Volinian and Galician uh, lands. And what it means taken, uh, actually all those lands, Northern Bukovina, Bessarabia, Eastern Galicia, and Volinia, uh, were populated mainly by Ukrainians, but also one third of, of the population was Jewish. So after uh, taking those lands, we have to understand also the attitude of Ukrainians to the Soviets. For them, Soviets were much worse than anything else because the repression started. And Stalin regime uh, for Western, particularly for Western Ukrainians, was the worst regime, worse than anything else. And for uh, and when Nazis arrived, actually there was alternative to horrible <clears throat> Soviet regime and Stalin. Uh, so you can see here first entrance of uh, the Soviet troops into Volinia, Ukrainian market. And you see also outfit of Ukrainians that they really were quite different from the Jews. And uh, this identity, also physical appearance, uh, made difference for the occupiers. Uh, that's why also so many Jews could be easily taken and killed by the occupiers. Okay, after this, we are going to the second part and uh, analyzing anti Semitism, the creation of kolkhozes, and growing unfriendly relations between Ukrainians and the Jews, actually, from the side of Ukrainians, we can uh, think about factors uh, which affected denunciation of the Jews by Ukrainians. And here I have to give a remark. By saying Ukrainians, I mean mainly Ukrainian population. But there was also Russian population. There were also Poles. There were also Moldovans, depends on the part of Ukraine. There were also uh, local Germans. There were also Czechs and many others. So we have to consider uh, that uh, Ukrainians Actually, yeah, majority, but not only uh, Ukrainians by ethnic identity. And uh, in historiography, usually when we are talking about collaboration and uh, researchers talk about denunciation of the Jews, they mostly spoke only about Ukrainians by ethnic origin, which I think uh, is not fair. But anyway, denunciation happened and it was a horrible thing because uh, one role and this uh, anti-Semitic propaganda played. And anti-Semitic propaganda took uh, everything worse from the Soviet Union and sub of course subverted it. And many things really were uh, truthful. Uh, as I said, for some uh, Ukrainians, Stalin's regime was much worse than the Nazi regime. And as, uh, this uh, help of propaganda to associate Jews with the communists and with Stalin was quite easy. 
and uh, therefore some Ukrainians started to hunt against the communism and the Jews as representatives of this communistic regime. Um, some of Ukrainians wanted to demonstrate their loyalty to the new regime uh, because loyalty could bring some benefits or at least uh, not to provoke uh, the occupiers. Hatred of everything that is related to the Soviet Union and Stalin's regime was combined uh, as I said, this hunting against communism and anti-Semitic propaganda. And actually, uh, Ukrainians who try to understand politics, um, <clears throat> uh, especially again in Volhynia and Eastern Galicia, associated many Jews with communists and Stalin. Uh, moreover, uh, when um, the Nazis uh, discover, uh, uncovered um, NKVD uh, murdering of uh, the, the non-communist non population. For example, such cases in Lviv and in Vinnytsia uh, when uh, secret prisons were opened and bodies just uh, shot before the invasion of, of the Nazis for taking. And um, Ukrainians didn't know whose bodies, for what these people actually punished, because relatives just disappeared. And then they were killed secretly. And when uh, fascists, when Nazis revealed this information and pointed that, oh, the Jews did it, of course, uh, some Ukrainians believed into it. So one uh, factor is institutional subordination and fulfillment of all orders, because the Nazi regime was the new regime, and uh, some Ukrainians tried to be uh, adaptive to this regime and fulfill whatever uh, Nazis wanted. And also some institutions were required to create lists with the name of the Jews and to give this list to the Nazi authorities. And in terms of subordination, the heads of such institutions couldn't reject, otherwise they would be either killed or imprisoned or at least uh, fired from uh, their positions. Uh, of course, one of the factors was again connected to the blood feud, and uh, that's why I mentioned the Bailey's case in uh, during the Russian Empire imperial time. It's uh, the slogan "Jews crucified Jesus" and traditional anti-Semitism uh, on everyday life level. <sighs> Encouragement by occupiers uh, in. Um, all towns and cities, there were announcements um, that uh, people can get reward for denouncing the Jews. Non-Jews can get reward for denouncing the Jew Jewish people. And um, this encouragement could be promotion uh, and giving certain position, verbal award that sometimes satisfied certain people but uh, mostly reward system implemented by the occupiers. And this reward system was very interesting because it existed not only on Ukrainian occupied lands, but also on Belarusian. And uh, it very much varied. In some uh, locations, um, the reward was just a bottle of vodka. In some uh, locations, it could be a bar of soap and tobacco, and in some, real money and not bad money. Uh, also, the possibility to loot clothes, food, furniture, jewelry, whatever to loot if Jews are denounced. And to pos the possibility to take flat or hut if Jews are denounced and killed, then Ukrainians could take, and there were many cases and testimonies we can see them. So, for example, one of the testimonies from the EU archive, which is uh, written in 1946 and uh, is called Ways of Death, uh, is about Odessa, uh, south of Ukraine. And here, uh, a person who wrote it, a uh, Holocaust Jewish survivor, uh, said that once uh, one guy arrived from nowhere, and uh, started to complain that uh, my neighbors don't allow me to enter my flat. 
uh, all my property was taken by the neighbors and I don't have where to sleep. I don't have what to eat. And uh, the author of this testimony asked, okay, where you have been before? And uh, this person, apparently also a Jew, said, I was in Bohdanovka. And Bohdanovka is a huge place for killing the Jews uh, uh, near the river Buh. And somehow this Jewish uh, uh, person uh, escaped, arrived to Odessa and couldn't find anything own. Everything was taken by the neighbors. But Another case of even worse, real denunciation, testimony of Mania Geyler from Vinnytsia region, Rice Commissariat, Ukraine. Uh, one uh, woman heard that uh, for denunciation of the Jews, common, uh, common, common, commandatur, uh, German commandatur uh, paid 100 rubles. And uh, she knew Jewish family consists of 16 people. She arrived to, do, uh, to that family and said, come to me, I will hide you, because if Germans will arrive, they will not find you. Uh, I will uh, hide you in my basement or on my attic. And uh, uh, Germans will not find you. So you have to collect all your stuff and come to me immediately. The Jewish family listened to this. They collected everything possible and they arrived to this woman. This woman really hit the Jewish family of 16 people. And also she asked money for hiding and uh, some clothes. Uh, she hid for several days. And after several days, she arrived to the Germans and denounced and the entire family. So the entire family was taken and killed. Uh, other reasons for like taking revenge uh, when uh, during, uh, sorry, before the Holocaust, uh, during personal relationship, uh, some people had very unfriendly relations and the Holocaust actually, the occupation uh, by Nazis actually opened the way to take this revenge. So there was completely personal reason to denounce the Jews. Envy for anything, for uh, position which Jews occupied before the war, for better life, uh, for better family, for anything. Prevor scandals or unfriendly relations. And uselessness of the Jews. In one of the testimonies, I found the case when a Ukrainian family asked a Jewish doctor um, to arrive and uh, uh, to heal a person. Actually, uh, a woman had to give birth and uh, needed midwife and then some complications started. The Jewish doctor helped and uh, arrived a couple of uh, days, was taken from the ghetto by bribing, arrived and uh, actually in uh, within several days, a Ukrainian woman was okay. She was completely healed. After this, relatives of this Ukrainian uh, woman denounced this Jew and uh, not only he had to return to the ghetto, but immediately he was killed. So they accused this doctor that uh, he stole some things from them. And they, uh, when um, witness discussed the situation, um, the witness say that actually this family thought that Jewish doctor is uselessness uh, because already he helped. What else to take from him? And of course, Prevo experience of kolkhozes. We shouldn't forget that some Ukrainians couldn't uh, excuse Jews for better survival. In most cases, there was a combination of factors. And here I come, uh, I almost finish. I need five more minutes uh, to also discuss um, the factors for rescuing the Jews. And here you see the map of Ukraine. Uh, the pink part is Rice Commissariat Ukraine, um, which was occupied by the Germans, controlled by the Germans. Uh, orange part was district of Galicia, also controlled by the Germans. Uh, bluish turquoise part is military administrative zone, controlled by the Germans, Wehrmacht. And yellow part, Transnistria Governorate, uh, which was occupied by Romanians. Uh, green part was under Hungary. 
uh, why we need this map? Because when I analyzed factors for denunciation of the Jews, I found the same factors uh, across the entire Ukraine. But when I analyzed the motivation and reasons for rescuing, I found very different reasons in uh, different uh, occupied zones. And they, uh, the, those reasons depended on the occupation. So as you see, this is photograph of um, uh, Galicia 1942, how Jews looked in, uh, during the occupation. And uh, looking at this photograph, one can imagine that helping such person or hiding such person was not easy. And why it's not easy? Because it would, would be obvious that person is a Jewish, we, we see bandage uh, um, with Magen Dovet star. Also, we see uh, outfit very poor. And uh, you have to risk uh, to hide or to help such person. And why you have to risk? Here we come to other reasons which affected helping and rescue of Jews by Ukrainians. And one of the reasons was fear, warning from the occupiers. And now the announcements were everywhere. Don't protect, don't help the Jews. Because if you do it, you will be punished for sheltering or any help. And uh, here we come to the key point. The punishment was different. Um, on Romanian occupied zone, the punishment was uh, mostly huge fines or servitude labor up to three years, sometimes combined. In all occupied German territories, the punishment was always death uh, for helper, uh, sometimes with and the entire family, including children and elder. That's why not so many people really wanted to help the Jews. Uh, very much help de depended on location, rural or urban, because in urban location to hide someone uh, was very difficult, to hide that others wouldn't know, that it wouldn't be visible, because hiding meant also feeding and uh, also uh, um, providing sometimes medications and uh, fulfilling, uh, fulfillment of other acts connected to human being, yeah? Uh, and unfortunately, not everyone could do it. In rural area, it was quite easier to do. Um, climate, of course, in winter, it was not easy to hide Jews in basements where it was extremely cold. And uh, hiding was much easier in warmer time. Topography. Uh, obviously, if one lives in, in the area of mountains or forests, it was much easier to create a dugout to, for hiding. Um, if someone lives in the plain field, or again, as I say, in urban area, it's not easy to create something invisible without risking for your own life. Material situation of helpers. Not everyone could afford to provide food if they uh, wanted to help Jews. And uh, as a major help, of course, hiding for several weeks, months, and sometimes years required providing this food. Uh, you can see how actually in Western Ukraine in 39 houses uh, looked. So obviously in such house, it's much easier to uh, hide someone in the attic or basement or create some uh, other hiding place than in, uh, uh, in the city. And then a very important physical conditions of helpers, because of course, disabled people or children, they couldn't help and they had to survive on their own. Uh, motivation and psychological factors. And I think, uh, according to my research, uh, based on the testimonies, uh, it's the most important part because uh, momentary emotions played a huge role in making a decision to help. And not only for hiding, but also just giving food or warning uh, about the danger. And of course, long-term long feelings like uh, respect or love uh, could make very big difference in making decision to help. 
Uh, some uh, Ukrainians felt injustice toward the Jews, that particular Jews are targeted, and that's why they tried to help. Uh, others had, uh, hated the Nazi regime and felt responsibility to help the victims, and in this way to resist the Nazi regime. Of course, family values played a huge role because how uh, people were raised in their childhood, which values they acquired, then they could and make a decision accordingly. Uh, religious beliefs, uh, this, uh, the same factor which actually played a um, negative role and uh, was a key, one of the key factors for denunciation, religious beliefs also helped uh, to make decision to uh, rescue the Jews because uh, of following commandments to not to kill and help those who are suffering. And of course, combinations of factors. And uh, the same narrative, the same uh, person who survived in Odessa and wrote the testimony, a little later uh, gave a case of uh, the woman, Ukrainian woman, whom he met on the road when tried to escape. And uh, he was very hungry. He didn't know what to do. And woman uh, was walking from the market. And he asked, uh, could you can please give me a little bit bread? And woman said, of course, take and cucumbers and milk and take it quickly because Germans will arrive soon. Uh, this woman uh, was a peasant and uh, she said that she has uh, also uh, some back to, and uh, the Jewish a person who wrote this testimony said that I uh, hid cucumbers into that bag and also I ate immediately milk with bread. And he said, thank you, I will never forget this. And this kind woman just left. And apparently she saved uh, the Jewish guy, uh, the Jewish survivor who wrote this testimony from starvation and from death out of starvation. The same, exactly same, uh, testimony of Mania Gale, which uh, only a couple of minutes ago I gave as example of denunciation, uh, brings in a couple of pages another example. Example uh, how uh, one uh, family allowed uh, Jew, uh, the Jew uh, to hide. And uh, they gave him vodka and then started to ask from where this Jew arrived. So he was, he was not friend, he was just a random person. And the, then, uh, according to her testimonies, uh, this Jew said that this family uh, gave me clothes, uh, I could wash myself, and then they kept uh, him until he was connected to partisans. And uh, Mania Gaylor in the end says that she knows the story from actually the survivor. So as a conclusion, I want to say uh, that uh, again, when we're talking about rescue, we also don't say that only Ukrainians rescued. And again, I should say that there were Czech villages which uh, rescued Jews. There were Polish uh, people, Russian people, Romanian, uh, and many others who also helped. And this is very important uh, to understand that in both cases, in case of rescue and in case of denunciation, uh, not only Ukrainians helped, but majority was Ukrainians. So main reasons for both denunciation and helping, actually political reasons, if we can generalize them, also social reasons, religious reasons, and of course, most important economic and personal reasons. Personal reasons played more role for rescuing, economic more for denunciation. And uh, in the end, I would like to say that we should, uh, as researchers, we should look to balance, to balance narratives. And when we research rescue and uh, we bring all cases. We shouldn't forget that there were cases of anti-Semitism and denunciation and other way around, researching killing of the Jews and denunciation. We should remember that there were many 
Ukrainians who saved uh, the Jews by risking their own lives. And thank you very much for your attention. And sorry for taking a little bit longer time. Uh, thank you so much, Hannah. That was really quite interesting. It's really a, a very broad, uh, complicated topic. Uh, and I think you dealt with it well. Um, you know, unfortunately, we we we've already gone over the the amount of time, but I think we could take we should take a couple of questions. Um, one of them is so someone asks uh, if the Jewish population in the Ukraine uh, outside of the Kolkhozi were were uh, affected by the Holodomor. Uh, Holodomor. Uh, is that you know what what can you say about that? Yes, I should say uh, that I didn't study this topic very precisely yet, because actually what Yivo gave me is discovering of this topic of call causes in relations to Ukrainian Jewish attitudes to each other before uh, the war. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know only from a couple of testimonies this, that, yes, Jews who were not in call causes uh, were affected, but I cannot say... Uh, in to what extent, uh, and I cannot say how many, right. but there are there are testimonies that they were affected. Right, uh, and also what uh, uh, what do Soviet archives say about uh, the agro joint funding of uh, of the kolkhozes? Um, this is kind of an interesting thing that the that the Soviets were willing to allow uh, Jewish charities to come in and and, and fund specifically Jewish uh, settlements. Uh, and with something that obviously affected relations between um, Jews and, and, and local people. So I'm, I'm wondering, you know, how, how this transpired and, and what the Soviet archives might say about it. Um, I uh, particularly worked with Ukrainian archives, uh, where most of documents which I could see were related to Holodomor and, of course, to Ukrainians. Uh, but what is interesting that I think the idea of agro join to create kolkhozes actually stimulated the Soviet government to create kolkhozes and create national kolkhozes on the entire Soviet territory. I cannot say this 100%, this is just a hypothesis. But what I observed that the idea of national kolkhozes came to the Soviet uh, government in 1929, 30, and already in early 30s, there were establishment of other national kolkhozes. For example, Roma colchoses. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it was very interesting because the idea was to introduce uh, nomadic Roma. Actually, I should say that uh, the majority of Roma were not nomadic in the Soviet Union at that time. They were semi-nomadic. It means in winter time they spent uh, the they, they just uh, lived in the houses, and uh, summertime they traveled uh, to find jobs. And also, some Roma was settled already from 18th century at least. But in the Soviet mind, they all were nomadic. And the idea was to introduce nomadic Roma agriculture. And I think this idea particularly came from uh, agrojoint because I didn't see this idea before to create national kolkhozes. This is what very interesting in uh, to research in 1930s. Um, but more than that, I cannot say because uh, I think more information can be found in Moscow in archives and because of certain reasons, I cannot go, of course, there because right. I'm a Ukrainian national and uh, yeah. Right. It's a great passport. Yeah. And now we have this war, Russia's war in Ukraine, which actually prevented us from archives and also from any, <laughs> not only possibility, but actually any wish to go to Russia. I'm sure, of course. Of course, it's understandable. Um, okay. And as I said, unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, so we can't take any more questions. Uh, but thank you very much. Uh, this uh, has been the. Um, uh, fellowship lecture given by Hannah Abukonova, it funded by the Professor Bernard Chosi Memorial Fellowship and the, the Natalie and Mendel Rakolin Memorial Fellowship. Uh, once again, Evo cannot provide these uh, fellowships and lectures to you um, without your help. So if you like what you saw today, please consider making a donation. Uh, and once again, uh, please uh, help me in thanking uh, Hannah Abu Kunava uh, for this uh, very interesting and compelling lecture. And we will see you next time.